So very excited for today's episode of Rebels of the Heart with our guest, Casey Fleming. Welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. It's, it's a great to have you. It's fun. It's a, it's a fun time to have this conversation. And, you know, it's, it's perfect. It's international. We're a couple of days after International Women's Day. And here yeah. you are talking about a topic of living your big, authentic life, right? Yeah. And doing that and in the spirit of Rebels of the Heart. And, and, you know, from our conversations, I know this is something that's near and dear to you and your purpose and your journey through the corporate life as well as your personal journey. So yeah, let's just start with that. How does that, how does that resonate with you? The title Rebels of the Heart, how does that, how does that show up for you in your personal professional journey, Casey? Yeah, I think it's so important, right? And, and I think when I think about being a rebel, you know, being a rebel gets such a rap, right? It gets this rap (laughs) of, you know, outcast, maybe cursing a lot, maybe, I don't know, whatever anybody thinks, right? I mean, for some people, maybe it means riding a motorbike. For some people, maybe it rides something else. Clearly not a biker with me calling it a motorbike. Uh, (laughs) Not that there's anything wrong with it. Just don't know that genre that well. But people think rebel in, in that vein. And I think of rebel as really speaking your authentic truth, right? having the courage and have having done the work to step in to whatever life is for you, right? This great authentic journey that is unique for every human. Mm-hmm. And that journey is through the heart. And the only way to get there is through some really tough stuff, right? Some soul searching, some figuring out who you are, some making mistakes, not always being your best self failing fast. Um, And so I really think being a rebel with a heart is someone who's not afraid to take chances, not afraid to leap into the unknown, to do something or try something they've always wanted to try and are afraid of, but doing it in a kind and compassionate manner and with empathy. And when you make a mistake, which we all inevitably do, right? Yeah owning up to it and having some grace about it and saying you're sorry. Um, Because I think when we think about how a lot of behaviors happen in in every place, right? Corporate is no different than anywhere else. You know, you see or can see this persona of um, high performer, but not kind, not empathetic. Everyone falls in the trap of having a bad day. But how do you own that? And how do you come back into your authenticity and really um, be someone who's inspired by others and someone whose behavior is inspiring instead of just being a performer, right? Yeah. So I'm going to come back to one topic that you shared a little bit, but I want to come back and look where you started with one of the first things that you said, which is having done the work. What does that mean to you? How is that? How does that? How do you define that? And how is that kind of relevant to this experience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've done a lot of work and I got a lot of work left. Um, Don't we all? Yeah. I just, I just like developed a character voice there because that's how much work I've done and have to do. Um, I think it means something different for everybody, right? I mean, everybody's journey looks a little different or a lot different. And, you know, for some people, you know, they came out of the womb knowing who they were and knowing what their purpose was and what they wanted to do in this world. And maybe they get kicked around later. Maybe they don't. Right. But I think for most people, you know, it's this journey of figuring out like authentically, who am I, Mm -hmm. what am I here to do? What's my purpose? And, you know, that changed a lot for me. (laughs) I think I started and and you and I've talked, I think the first time we met, I was an actor, right? And that was the world that I grew up in. And and all I ever wanted to do my whole life, once I realized that was something that I could do, you know, and then that changed. And in doing that career, there's so much ego and there's so much um, vanity and there's so much pressure and that's everywhere, right? That can be everywhere, but it really kind of shown that light really strongly on where some of my, my weaknesses were, right. Or my opportunity areas, right. Um, you know, my tendency to, um, 
jump to conclusions to not assume positive intent. My tendency is to think maybe people are thinking about me when they're not. Um, they're thinking about their own stuff, right? And and you know, to love in the wrong places, all those things that that you know, yeah, I've done, and they're all a part of who I am today. And rather than skipping over them or not acknowledging them as you know the messy middle of my life, that that's the work. Like that's where the gold lies. When when somebody says to me, you know what, you really came off like a bull in a china shop today, and I have to go back and be like, I thought I already did this work. Like, come on, man. Like I thought I already got over this, and and then here I am, you know, having a bad day and showing up like a bull in a china shop, right? Um, so it's really every time you're you're doing something, whether it's new or something old, it's keeping that beginner's mindset and really being aware of yourself yeah. and not beating yourself up when you make a mistake, but yeah. taking the time to process that, to move on so yeah. that you just keep doing better, not your best, not perfect, not amazing, just your best every day. Mm. And I think that's what I mean when I mean doing the work. It's really figuring all that messy middle stuff out that's always yeah. happening. I, I love your philosophy around this and your definition and the specificity you've given. I'm curious if you would be open to it, share a little more about your your journey, both you know, personally, more so in the, in the professional realm. How has this kind of shown up for you in the different paths along the way? And how is yeah. it making or informed where you are now and in, in what you're doing today for your work? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a hundred percent responsible for where I am today. And so I'm grateful for every one of those mistakes that I've made. I think, you know, look, I, I really, after leaving acting for a variety of reasons, you know, having, um, you know, eating challenges, um, not feeling like I was succeeding in a way that was anywhere near where I wanted to go, right? I was really goal oriented. I was working so hard at getting to be a better actor and the better I got, the less work I got sometimes. And, mm. you know, it, it really wasn't working for me. I was lost for a lot of years. Mm. Um, and I ended up in pharmaceutical sales. Uh, of course, the career I told my parents I would never end up in, not because it's oh. not wonderful and not because I don't love my company, but because they always wanted me to do that. They thought I'd be great at it. And I didn't want to be, I guess I was a rebel. I didn't want to be what, <laughs> what they wanted me to be, but I, I wound up there and, you know, it was great for me. I was natural at selling. Um, Why did they want you there out of curiosity? Why did your parents want you to go down that path? I think they wanted me to go down that path because they knew that I would be successful because I had a science brain. Okay. Um, and a big boisterous personality, even though I'm quite introverted, um, I can, I can yak it up with the best of them. I've gotten much more introverted, uh, as I've gotten older. Um, but they thought it would be a really good path for me. And I think they didn't want to worry about me, right. They didn't want to worry about me being an actor or me dreaming big and, you know, failing and they just wanted to see their kids successful and happy. And you know, I love them for that. Right. Like it, it was a great career. It, it really was. I had great moments. I won some awards and had fun with it and then moved inside. Right. And decided it was time to, um, come in, learn a little more. Um, and I, I flopped around in various jobs. I refer to myself as kind of like a pharmaceutical daf jackknife, if you will. Um, <laughs> I stole that from someone. Uh, I think Sean McCabe called himself a pharmaceutical jackknife. So Sean, if you ever listen to this, I think I stole that from you. But nice. um, I, you know, was in communications wow. and some operations roles. Yeah. I did marketing roles okay. and I got really out of alignment at one point. I just, I, I wasn't doing what my heart was meant to do. I wasn't called to the work in the way that I had been called to acting. Yeah. Um, personally, you know, I had an illness that kind of took over my life and suddenly I couldn't eat anything. And, you know, it all just kind of came to a head. All of this stress and this 
misalignment um, and personal challenges. Yeah. And it manifested as not being able to eat. And I had to figure that out. And so that's kind of really what led me down the path of well being. I had yeah. always been involved as an actress and, you know, health and nutrition and beauty products and that kind of wellness side of well being. Um, but really that that burnout, that getting to the point where food wasn't being digested, that I couldn't focus or function, um, led me to question kind of everything. And that question led me to uh, get my yoga teacher training certi certification. I was probably going to leave business. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And did that and thought, wow, this is great, but I really don't want my own yoga studio. And then got <laughs> sicker and thought, I better learn about this body. Like, I think I'm eating healthy. I think like quinoa is healthy, but maybe quinoa is not healthy for me, right? Like what's going on here? Um, and so I went to Institute for Integrative Nutrition and got certified, healed myself with the help of a great practitioner, dug deep into the well-being realm and woke up one day and, and said, I got to go into work and find a way to do this thing that I'm doing in my personal life yeah. at work yeah. because there's millions of people for the yoga population, for the people that already had all the wellness, yeah. but there aren't people taking care of people in corporations. And I was seeing people yeah. like me and I wanted to help. And that's how I got here. How amazing that you had that opportunity to define your purpose and then bring that experience all those experiences back into what you're doing now right and and working within and really helping and supporting people and investing in people's wellness from within a corporate environment right it's, in, it's incredible and what i'll say about it because i want everybody in the world to kind of hear this message <laughs> that i don't think i believed right um it felt like it was never going to happen like i was one of those purpose seeking individuals right you get different people that are just kind of people have like i love this career i love this job and you get people yeah. that are like oh my job supports my family and my hobbies. There's no better in any, there's no judgment in what you should be like. But I was one of those people that was like terrified I would die without my purpose. Like it just, it ate at me daily because acting was really a purpose for me with yeah. a passion. And I lost that. And I was like, am I ever going to find something again? And this work is, I mean, I look at it every day. And I probably would have burned out worse as an actress because I had so many, I had so much messy middle stuff to deal with that I don't know that I could have dealt with it in that spotlight. So it took me all this time to really get to a place where, you know, I could find my purpose, yeah. execute on it, and hopefully share it with others so that they can do the same. So what is your day-to-day -day like right now in this, in this role, in this work for you? Yeah. I'm in a really interesting time. It's really amazing. Um, so when I got into this role, we were just building out the strategy um, for well being, fleshing it out. You know, there was a lot of work gating communication channels, making sure we could get to the, all of the people within my company, um, understanding the structure and everything um, within the organization and the data, and really what different groups of people were struggling with. And, did we have the right resources and all yeah. of that sort of thing. Um, now we're in this place where we've got this, I think, really strong program. It's still in the beginning. Yeah. Companies doing an amazing job and we're refining it and really refining the strategy. But more than that, in my day-to-day, -day, um, I'm getting the opportunity really to speak with people, to get out, to talk to other thought leaders in the space, um, you know, about well-being and yeah. what they're doing and what we're doing and see if we can all find our way to kind of, I don't mean to sound so utopian, right? But create a better world. I think yeah. that there's a lot of people suffering and the numbers keep getting worse in this world as to, you know, mental challenges, mental health challenges to burnout. I was trying to figure out which, which word I wanted to pick with that because it's, it's, it's all across the board. I think in reality, like mental health, it's a funny, it's a funny thing to me, Derek, like mental oh. health, like mental health is a spectrum, just like physical health, right? Like I, if you get a stomach ache, 
that's like on the low end of like physical health challenges versus like breaking a leg or having cancer, right? Absolutely. And then mental health is the same way. Every single human being gets a mental health stomach ache <laughs> once in a while. Absolutely. And all the way through to, you know, someone like myself who suffered from for an entire lifetime of anxiety or OCD or other, you know, diagnosable mental health disorders. I yeah. think um, a lot of the work that we're doing beyond, you know, the basic blocking and tackling, blocking and tackling of setting up um, programs and strategies and making sure we're reaching people and getting them what they need and meeting them where they are is stopping this stigma around some of these really big topics like mental health concerns yeah. or, you know, one that I'm really passionate about right now, probably because I'm going through it and I'm really honest about it is perimenopause and menopause, which so much of the workforce yeah. is facing, right? And and it's not like I'm trying to set myself up as a menopause whisperer, but when I right. have these conversations in places like LinkedIn, the number of women and men that come yeah. forward and feel seen and talk and feel better that they're not alone in it is really staggering. So I think the job now has really changed a lot because we're in this new place where we're talking about all these things that we didn't talk about for all these years. Awesome. And so it's exciting. Yeah. So let me, I agree with you. Thank you for sharing your, your stories openly as well and, mm -hmm. and your present experience as well. What, um, so kind of a tactical question. When, when you brought this purpose to your employer, was this an idea that you generated or was this an idea that was already being incubated within your organization? Was it a senior leadership driven idea? And why did they either buy into your vision or why did they invest in this as a priority relative to all the things that employers are dealing with, quote unquote? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, when I first got involved in well-being, um, I was with one employer that already had a really big, robust program. Yeah. And so they were totally bought into having me help and were very supportive of, you know, while I did my other marketing roles, kind of taking on um, preceptorships to learn the world of well-being and, and were really gracious. Um, you know, my organization now is very forward in the well-being space and you know, are extremely supportive of well-being as a corporate priority, not just, yeah. you know, what we see a lot of times is kind of, let's throw some apps at people, let's throw some programs at people. Um, the company's very, very proactive with wanting to make sure that our people can bring their best selves to yeah. work and home, right? It's yes. a, it's a win-win. And, um, do you, I see your senior, do you see your senior leadership modeling that? They, do they model the way in that regard? Yeah, I see. I see it. I see it more and more. I yeah. see it more and more and more. My CHRO is a very big um, advocate. Uh, CEO is a big advocate, and all the other senior leaders yeah. in between have kind of taken part in in webcasts and programs that yeah. we've done. Um, and I see acknowledgement much more broadly than there used to be that Amazing. this is not going away. And I think yeah. it's probably because, you know, for those of us that were in the space before COVID, yeah. we knew there was a need and, you yes. know, it was, it was clear. I think from a business perspective, when your day-to-day -day is not thinking about these well-being topics, COVID really may have brought it to the forefront, right? I think yeah. all of the sudden it was like, holy moly, we've got Undeniable. all these people. Like, you can't ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm in a super positive 10. I don't, I don't even think like, I know that was a turn of a phrase, but I don't even think it was ignoring. I think it was not even realizing, you know, what, what was starting to happen. I think um, even after COVID, you know, and I have my own theories about, the great resignation and why it happened. But I think we see more and more and more studies and research come out around the importance of this topic. And it's not something that is separate from performance. Well-being and performance are inextricably linked. And I think that's the realization. I don't think 
anybody, well, I can't say I don't think anybody. I'm sure there are people that don't think well-being is important, but not in my organization. I think exactly. I, I think it's that the way that quote unquote wellness, and again, this is semantics and people argue sure. with me on the podcast and I'm sure I'll get comments, but I won't call it wellness because wellness to me means a lot of things I really love. It means green juice, it means crystals, it means yoga, um, it means matcha, which I was just drinking, and all of these <laughs> really awesome things. Yeah. But it doesn't get to the heart of where we are today and what we need as humans today, which is connection on some level, right? Whether it's via Zoom or it's in person, it's yeah. autonomy, it's um, purpose, it's joy, it's all of these things that yes. we really need. Um, and so, like I said, I think that well being and performance go like peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah. But wellness and performance doesn't sound the same. I think, and I think that's sad because I don't think that that's true, right? I think that, well, like yoga yeah. definitely, meditation definitely helps, all these things sure. help, but they're not for everybody. Everybody's well being is not it's journaling personal. and meditating. Right, it's personal. Right. right. So it's, it's how do we change the paradigm? And then, you know, just even looking at where my job used to be to what my job is today, yeah, it's night and day. And, and I owe a lot of that to my organization and yeah. the way that they have taken such a strong stance on well-being because they've given the department the runway to really make a difference and to change. Yeah. Yeah. So to that point, what, what do you see or what, what would you envision from a, not just me, the organization, but broadly speaking within healthcare industry or broader business community how how is how is the responsibility the ability of employers the relationship between employers and and employee families how do you see that evolving to reflect this integrated well-being performance kind of in a in a meaningful successful way what does that look like do you have a, a vision for that i mean i have i have thoughts i don't know if i yeah. call it a goal cool. thoughts are good we can we can work with that yeah <laughs> i have thoughts um I think certainly a lot of our offerings, as many as possible, we make available to the entire family. And especially as it relates to mental health. Yeah. Um, and we have like a wide spectrum of things that we offer, but from the most basic intervention in a meditation app all the way up, you know, things are fully available for the family because we know, right? It's like, things aren't good mm -hmm. with family members. You can't then, show up well at the workplace. That's right. That's right. And so I think that the industry is really going to go in that direction. I think to some extent it's been in that direction with the fact that a lot of employers, you know, prior to any of this happening had offered health benefits to partners Perfect. and families, um, you know, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about the healthcare industry and pharma and biotech in particular I think, you know, I've had a long career in, in pharma and biotech, and I've had a lot of discussions with people who have opinions. Um, I've never seen a group of employers who treat their employees from a health and well-being perspective better. The resources that are available to employees and their families, whether it's family planning or it's family forming or it's, I mean, always ahead, right? And always inclusive and, and thinking about everybody really belonging and having what they need to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that's evolved a lot. I mean, I think it's gotten a lot more inclusive. Obviously that's a work in progress every day. Um, you know, the mental health is kind of, it's definitely not the final frontier. I think there are a million more frontiers, but I think that opening up all of the discussions and companies that have started to do um, things around women's health, yeah. um, it's 
it's really transformative. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. And I also think one of the things that's going to play biggest into employee well-being, and I'm going to say this really deliberately um, because I'm writing my thesis paper on it right now and I don't yeah. like it called hybrid, um, flexibility. Yeah. I, I think here's the thing in the research, the 120 hours of research that I did, um, the 32 papers I read, uh, and then some, the conclusions, right? Are there something really amazing about giving humans choice? Yes. When, where, how, not all three at once, not all three at the same time but just giving people some form of choice and autonomy over one of those factors can make a difference. So I know a lot of workers out there can't, they don't sit at a desk like I do. They don't have the ability to calendarize and, you know, hybrid's like a big old joke, right? If you work in a manufacturing facility, hybrid's a joke. Absolutely. Um, but if you think flexible, right? I think there's a lot of places and ways, you know, that, that people are looking at to, adjust shifts, to um, adjust hours, to find different ways to put breaks in place. Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the topics that I love to talk about is how we work. Like I mentioned to you at the top, yeah. you would never know it from listening to me run at my mouth, but I'm an introvert, right? And, and I do really, really well. You can throw me up on stage in front of tons of people because I was an actor and I'm going to be comfortable. I'm going to find somebody's face that's smiling and I'm going to be able to be authentic and be myself because yeah. I've learned that over the course of my life. Right. Um, but if you take me off that stage and people start coming, yeah. I'm like, Oh, Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Put me, put me in the corner. Let me hide. Right. And so for me working full time in an office setting, it's yeah. really tiring, right? Like I get drained. I can't focus even when I'm sitting there, like my yeah. company's incredible with this policy. Yeah. But even when I'm in there, it's not that anyone's even bothering me. It's like, I literally, my brain just doesn't work with the distractions everywhere. And that's just how I'm wired, right? And I think we have to acknowledge that people are all wired in their own way. Some people, like you see them come in the office and they like light up and they yeah. love it. And they're so happy. Um, so we think that there needs to be we need to continue to look at choice. Yeah, I guess I'll ask a question. I, don't, I genuinely have an answer to this one. You know, it's like, is there a way to actually give people that level of getting the, the ideal environment, style, culture that they want with the, 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 the multiple, multiple realities can exist within a company and still get to a singular, maybe not singular, but a, you know, a, a common outcome or series of outcomes that is aligned with a sustainable business model, right? Is that, is that possible? And, you know? Yeah, you know, I don't know how this is all gonna play out, right? I think there are two schools of thought in my brain. My brain has a conversation yeah. with itself on this, right? Um, one of the conversations my brain has is, this is totally doable. Um, yeah. We find ways to create flexibility and choice. And let me just stop and say, I am, and no, I'm not inclined to be a CEO ever. So no one's asking me this question for real. But I think um, I think there's definitely ways to find elements of choice yeah. for individuals who work in manufacturing, for individuals who work behind a computer, for individuals who work in a lab or a retail setting. And all of those can exist in one company. Does yes. it look the same? No, I don't. It, do, it doesn't. Right. I think the other thing that is a possibility in my mind um, is that companies have some really clear cut culture. So I think we see, we saw a lot of um, financial industry companies uh, mandating everybody go back in, in the city and some places like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that the second kind of thought that could happen is that companies have their culture and people choose their company based on the culture they want to work at. Right. And, that's, that's okay. That's what's happening now. That's what, that's what's starting to happen. Right? That's okay too, right? Like that's okay. I think, um, you know, I'm never gonna claim to be right, much as I'd love to on this topic. I I really believe the data strongly supports giving workers some level of choice somewhere um, for well being. 
Yeah. yeah. But with that said, the company can do what the company wants to do. And then, you know, the employees have to choose the culture they want to work for. And, and that's fine. Like I said, I know so many people that like love to go in the office and they look at me like I'm crazy because I can't stand it. Um, even though we have a lovely, we have lovely offices. I, I like, I actually like going in once at a blue moon, but it's just, I prefer to work at home. Um, and so it's just different, different strokes for different folks, right? Everybody wants something different. And I think that's okay. Um, we just have to figure out, it's like that with well-being too. We have to figure out how to pick solutions and things that really can be tailored to the individual need. Not that we have 4,000 solutions, which is I think where we, where we used to come from this land of like, oh, I want to have everything. Yes. And it's like a menu and then you have too much choice and then people, no one, but no one knows what you have. And also no part, of, part of the other challenge that we have is there, there is that, that paradox of choice, right? So totally, 100%. Hundred percent. So I think um, I think either one of those realities could happen. Obviously, life. Yeah. Not to get like super philosophical, because it's just not going to work for me with this. It's not going to work for me with this personality, but we'll try. Um, I think life is getting much more tailored yeah. to the individuals. Even if you look at healthcare and genetic sequencing and genetic testing, and um, you know dietetic testing and all of these different things it's it's just going in that direction right life is just becoming more personalized and therefore work is going to fall into that quadrant too because i know it, we people love to call it work life balance i call it life work alignment because work is part of life and not the other way around even if you spend more time yeah. in your work it's still your life right <laughs> so Beautiful. Case, we talked about this for hours, and I look forward to that. I look forward to the future of creating this this environment and different environments with you and different companies. And I'm glad you're doing this work. Thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts and your heart with our audience. How can how can our audience reach you, learn about you, follow your work, uh, collaborate with you? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say LinkedIn is pretty much the best way to find me. Um, Casey, K A C Y Fleming, F L E M I N G. It's all going to be in the bio at the end, right? That's going to go with this video on LinkedIn. And, and I'll uh, give all that information to you, Derek. But I'm very active on it because it, it's odd. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't something I ever did deliberately, right? Like I had Instagram like everybody else. I had Facebook like everybody else. I got rid of Facebook, kept Instagram. Whole other story um, for another podcast about nothingness. Um, but when I started posting authentically on LinkedIn, that's when I met you. That's when I really started meeting people. And so I try to be really good about getting back to people. Um, I do my best and I, I, I always try to respond. I can't always do everything, but I always try to respond because so many people have helped me out and I'd love to do the same. So Amazing. Well, again, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for sharing your time and your heart with us. Congre Welcome to the Rebels of the Heart community. And uh, we're thank here to support you. you as well. Thank you. It's so great to be here. I appreciate it.